happen to record this. Okay, so just a heads up is that next class we are going to have a quiz in the digestive system, and I'm going to post a practice quiz after this class. So just ended with the uh, this um, stomach di di stomach digestion which as we know, stomach digestion is going to be the site of both mechanical and chemical digestion. It's actually a nice mix of both. So we are now on to our whiteboard here. And now we are going to go on to the next phase, which is going to be the small intestines. And we, we really focus on the first 12 inches of the small intestines called the duodenum. And you know what, what duo means? Two? Yeah, or 12 actually, but yeah. Uh, uh, duo means 12. It is the first 12 inches of the small intestines. So naturally we call it the duodenum. So um, what really is involved in, in and duodenal digestion is going to be three things. Well, actually four things. Uh, we can count count the liver, but we'll kind of uh, we'll kind of ignore that for just a bit. But it's going to involve a organ called the pancreas, which I drew here in orange, and it is going to involve the small intestines but the first 12 inches of it. So I'm gonna draw that in sort of this nice bluish color here. So are we on the intestinal phase? You got it, we are in the intestinal phase. Okay, thank you. So this is the duodenum. It goes right into the next part of the small intestines. And then up here, we are going to have something called the gallbladder, which unfortunately is frequently clogged up with stones and needs to be removed. Gallbladder. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Oh my God. I'm going to mute everyone. Just uh, if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself. Okay, so we have the pancreas, and then we have the gallbladder, and we have the, the duodenum. Oh, and I forgot to draw the pancreatic duct. Pancreas is a very important organ. It's, it's also, it's both an exocrine and endocrine uh, organ. And next unit, we're going to be talking about the endocrine function of it. But for the digestive system, we talk about the exocrine uh, function of it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw a close-up of what's going on in the duodenum. Let me kind of draw some cells here. So this is a close-up of what's going on in the duodenum. And we have in here some cells. So what I'm pretty much doing is drawing this part here. And these cells are the cells that make up the lining of the intestines. So if you are in anatomy right now, you probably have learned about the mucosa and submucosa. Right now, we are discussing the mucosal layer in case you're currently learning that. For those of you taking anatomy, I'm sure that it's been a real adventure transitioning to online learning. And I'm sure your instructors are being driven absolutely crazy over it. All right, so this is the inside the, of the duodenum. We call it the lumen. Recall that lumen means um, the inside of an organ. And I'm just gonna draw off to the side here. This is not anatomically correct by any means, but this is the pancreas here. And this is going to be the duct, pancreatic duct. 
and then also not anatomically correct by any means, but we're going to draw here the gallbladder. It looks like a swan or bird, stork, whatever, but here we have the gallbladder. And inside the gallbladder, anyone know what's inside the gallbladder? Bile. Bile, yeah, perfect. It's a substance called bile, which we'll be talking about in a bit. So inside the gallbladder is bile. Let me draw that. Let me give it a nice green color nice soothing green. And these cells here are cells called enterocytes. And these are the cells that comprise the mucosal lining of the intestines, enterocytes. These cells are rapidly replaced via mitosis. In fact, they're replaced about once every seven days, whether or not they are still functional or not. Um, Basically, the optimal functioning of, this, of these cells is so important that these cells actually undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death around day seven of their, of their life cycle. So whether or not they're still good or not, they're, they're killed off and then they're replaced with a, a fresh new set of cells. Okay, so let me make sure I'm consistent with the outline here. Um, now, there's a, a couple of things that we are going to talk about first, just to kind of make our lives easier when we get into the process. So, of course, we talked about the duodenum, the first 12 inches of the small intestines, and it is the site um, where the pancreatic enzymes react with the chyme, because chyme enters it is going to enter the duodenum. So, and I recall this chyme is like a acid smoothie. So it's a very acidic chyme. Okay, so the duodenum is where the pancreatic enzymes are going to mix with the chyme. And it's also where bile interacts with the, with the foodstuffs as well. Now we have a hormone that is going to be secreted from the, the enterocytes. And this hormone is going to be called secretin. And what secretin does is it is going to go up here and it's going to signal to the bio, to the, the gallbladder, it's going to tell it to contract. And when it contracts, it's going to squeeze. And you can probably guess what's going to happen is that when it, when it contracts, bile is going to enter the duodenum. So when it contracts, then bile is released. Of course, this is a little bit different if there's no gallbladder. And we'll talk about what happens there in a couple of minutes. So secretin is a hormone that is secreted by the enterocytes that is received by the gallbladder. It's received by receptors on the gallbladder and it's going to tell the gallbladder to contract and release bile. Now, the other hormone is really important, vitally important. And we call this one, we call it CCK, that's the abbreviation. The other term for it is called cholecysto. Kinin. So you can kind of understand why CCK is the more uh, uh, preferred terminology for it. So we talked about, about secretin. What CCK is going to do is it is going to it's going to be secreted by the enterocytes, and it is going to interact with the pancreas 
and it's going to tell it to release enzymes. And we have a couple of pancreatic enzymes here. So let's, let's go ahead and talk here about the, the pancreatic enzymes. And the first one is going to be called lipase. And I will give you the definition in just a moment. Then we have HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate. Then we have one called amylase, which if you recall, is also secreted in the, through the salivary ducts, amylase. Then we have one called trypsinogen. Trypsinogen. And we have one more chymo, trypsin, ogen. Sorry for the small handwriting. We will go over them more in just a moment. So that's the job of CCK. Then we have one more enzyme, and it's getting a bit crowded, so I'm actually going to expand our dual genome here. It's going to get a new wing. And this other one is going to be called enteropeptidase, has an, another name, enterokinase. But what this is going to do is it is going to actually act on, on trypsinogen. So it is going to convert trypsinogen going to convert it to trypsin. Professor, where do those three enzymes come from for peptides? They are, oh. The trypsinogen, the trypsin. Um, so, so trypsinogen is released from the pancreas. Okay, got it. And would this be exocrine? It's... Yes, these are all exocrine. Okay, thanks. Oh, you got it. So now we're going to talk about our our different enzymes here. And the first one we'll talk about, if you don't mind, I'm going to erase my wonderful, wonderful diagram here. So the first pancreatic enzyme we are going to talk about Actually let me call on on you guys. I don't want this to seem seem too much like a totalitarian um, endeavor here. So the first on my top list is going to be Marianne. Which pancreatic enzyme do you want to talk about, Marianne? Which one do you want to start with? Uh, amylase. Amylase. Okay, great. So amylase is an enzyme that's a catabolic enzyme. What it's going to do is it's going to convert polysaccharides going to convert those long chains of carbohydrates known as starch or glycogen and it's going to convert them into disaccharides and if you recall a disaccharide is two monosaccharides together so it's going to take these long complex chains of starch and it's going to break them down into smaller units called disaccharides which is just two sugars combined. So it is a di digestive enzyme that works on carbohydrates, on polysaccharides. It's called amylase. Very important for breaking down starches. During the PhysioX experiments, if you've already, already done it, you've seen the effects of, of, um, of amylase through the various experiments that they've, that they've put you through. All right, great. Any questions on amylase? Right on. So next on my top friends list is going to be Vanessa. Which one do you want to talk about next? Chymotrypsinogen. Uh, okay, so chymotrypsinogen. 
has the distinction of doing absolutely nothing until it is broken down into or converted into chymotrypsin. So it needs to be first converted into chymotrypsin. That is priority number one, and we'll talk about how that happens. But what this is going to do is it's going to convert peptides into smaller peptide fragments. Does that say convert into chymotrypsin? Yep, so it needs to be turned into chymotrypsin first. We'll talk about how that happens. Um, but what it does is it takes peptides, which are the chains of amino acids, and it converts them into smaller peptides. If you recall, we talked about we talked about on the, the in the previous lecture that there was an enzyme secreted from the gastric pits that started to cleave chains of proteins. Anyone remember what that chain was called? Jacqueline, uh, what was that protein digesting enzyme called in the stomach? Um, I completely forgot. Sorry, pass. Okay, thank you. Anyways, Jasmine, what's that protein digesting um, uh, enzyme called that secreted in the... I had a feeling you were going to call on me. Yeah. Is it uh, pepsinogen or pepsin? Pepsin, yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of enzymes responsible for this because, as we talked about, proteins are incredibly tough. They're incredibly resilient. Um, many a person has damage their teeth trying to eat beef, beef jerky, which is pure protein. That just tells you how strong uh, uh, peptides are. So that's why we need so many enzymes that are going to, to break down peptides. Great, very good. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, okay, so next on my list is going to be Marissa. You are next on my top list. So which enzyme do you want to talk about next? Uh, which one? Lipase. Lipase. Powerful enzyme. Because lipase has the dis distinguished position of breaking down fats. So what it does is it converts fats, which really is a triglyceride. It converts triglycerides which what a triglyceride is, is we'll talk about it, about it more when we get to metabolism. But it is a, a glycerol head. So it's kind of like a phospholipid with a third, third tail. So it's a glycerol head with three fatty acid tails. So it converts fats into what we call monoglycerides, which is exactly what it sounds like one glycerol head with one tail, and also three fatty acids. So does roaming chains of, um, of fats like this. And this is, is necessary because we need to break these down into their basic building blocks if we're going to do things like synthesize hormones or, or use them for energy or reconfigure them into, into fat molecules. So it's, it converts these triglycerides into monoglycerides and also just free fatty acids. So it's a fat digesting enzyme. All right, very good. But well, we have some more enzymes. Um, Jessica, can you tell us which enzyme you want to talk about next? Cholecystokinin. Ah, okay. Great. So cholecystokinin. So this is going to be an enzyme. I'm going to go ahead and erase these, this here. It is a not, not an enzyme, it's a hormone. So cholecystokinin, which I will go ahead and generously call CCK, kind of reminds me of pizza for that reason. Like, I mean, well, oh, that's, that's CPK. Okay, got it, got it. All right. 
Well, anyways, so this is not a pancreatic enzyme. This is a, this is a hormone, CCK, cholecystokinin. Let me write it out here. Kind of rolls off the tongue if you, you think about it. Cholecystokinin. What this does is it triggers pancreas to release enzymes. And the stimulus for it, recall that the digestive system basically has its own nervous system. So the stimulus for it is actually going to be chyme. So chyme is the stimulus that's, that's going to trigger all of these hormones um, from the enterocytes. Okay, right on. So that is the stimulus, it's chyme, it triggers the pancreas to release its um, trope of digestive enzymes. All right, next on my list is going to be Laura. So Laura, what do you want to talk about next? Um, let's go with trypsinogen. Oh, okay. So trypsinogen, another one of my favorites. Who am I kidding? They're all my, my favorites. How can I choose between them? So trypsinogen also does nothing until it is converted to trypsin. And what does that, since we can kind of kill two birds with one stone, is enteropeptidase is required to convert it to its active form, trypsin. If, if enteropeptidase is not present, it's not going to be converted into trypsin. And what, what trypsin does is it is going to um, break down peptides into smaller fragments. Now, you're probably wondering, well, how does this differ from chymotrypsin? And the answer is, it just specializes in, in different amino acid structures. But for the intensive purposes of this course, we just assume that they have the same function, which they do, it's just they specialize in slightly different types of fragments, that's all. All right, radical. Next on my list is going to be Michelle. So Michelle, which enzyme or hormone do you want to talk about next? Um, I think enteropeptidase. I don't. I didn't say that right. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. So enteropeptidase. I'll save us some time and just put this in the box. Its job is to convert trypsinogen into trypsin. So that one was. Okay. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Good choice. Good choice. <laughs> okay. So we have just um, a couple. Can you repeat that? Hmm. So enteropeptidase converts trypsinogen into trypsin. Okay, next up is Caroline. Actually, I think we only have a, one more left, but... Um, can we do secretin? Secretin, also known as secretin, depending on, well, how you want to pronounce it, really. And secretin has the very important job. It is going to contract the gallbladder. Now, since we are on the topic, what's going to happen if the gallbladder is removed? Well, what's going to happen is that you aren't going to have anything to, to contract then. So your major reservoir that's, that stores the bile is going to be gone. It's going to go away. 
So instead, what happens is that since you don't have a gallbladder anymore, you just have a tube. So bile continually leaks into the, the duodenum. So instead of being stored and then contracted, it's just going to leak down continuously. Um, since bile is involved in fat digestion, as we'll talk about shortly, if you have your, gall your gallbladder removed, you can generally resume a pretty normal diet, but you have to watch, watch how many fats you consume at once. And I'll tell you why when we get to that part. All right, great. So if we are gonna go down to our, to our, to our steps here, if you look at the outline, now we're going to do duodenum digestion steps. And I kind of already have drawn it here, but I'll go ahead and redraw it. So I'm gonna start with, once again, I'm going to start with the duodenum. Was the bicarb just for uh, a buffer? Oh, oh thank you. Um, so yes, when the chyme enters the duodenum, it has a very low pH. And the problem is, is that the pancreatic enzymes need a slightly basic pH. So what the bicarbonate does is it is going to raise the pH of the chyme or else the enzymes would not, would not work. Yes, thank you. The bicarbonate is going to raise the pH of the of the chyme, which is going to allow the digestive enzymes to work. These light base, amylase, so on and so forth, they are involved in um, they they require a slightly basic pH. Thank you for reminding me of that. And then to save some time, this is going to be our pancreas, a nice rectangle. This is the pancreatic duct, and this is going to be our gallbladder here another square. Okay, so the, the first thing that's, that's going to happen is this nice acidic chyme is going to enter the, the duodenum. So this is step one. Step one is chyme is going to enter the, the duodenum. Now, when it enters, it is going to stimulate the and and the enterocytes. So these these zeros mean that it, the chyme is going to be detected by the enterocytes. And of course, they are going to secrete three hormones. And the reason why I'm not writing this down is because it is on the outline. And of course, you're always more than welcome to replay this video and draw this as many times as you want to. So what's going to happen here is that we are going to have CCK released, enteropeptidase, I'll just abbreviate it EP, and then we are going to have secretin. Oh, we have some chat act activity. Well, let's Let's see what's going on here. I'm excited. Um, Shia Labouf. Um, I don't know who that is, but he's welcome to join our class if he wants to. Bile, indeed. Uh, we'll be talking about bile soon. And pepsin, yes, that was, I'm assuming, to the previous question, yes. Uh, pepsin is the first enzyme. It's very important that you note this. Pepsin is the first enzyme that is going to start to cleave proteins. And that happens in the stomach, requires a very low pH. Difference between triglycerides and cholesterol. They're actually two very different structures. They have similar properties, but if you look at the structure of a triglyceride versus cholesterol, you'll see that cholesterol has a ring-like structure. So it's actually quite different. Uh, but they're but they're all considered to be in the fat category. Yeah, actually, Laura just answered that. Never mind. Yeah, so Laura, very good. Okay, 
Great. All right, now each of these three things do a, a coordinated effect. We know that secretin is going to tell the, the gallbladder to contract and it's going to cause bile to be released. Now, we also know that CCK is going to go to the pancreas and it's going to trigger release of enzymes, the release of our digestive enzymes. And then they are going to be secreted into oh little girl. You want to say hi? I got a box. I got a box. Oh, say say hi to my class. This is my niece, my niece Violet. Hi. Hi, Violet. She said she, said she wanted to teach the class. And and I said I, I said you probably would like that better than what I'm 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 teaching them. All right, so it's secreted into the duodenum. And then we know that enteropeptidase, or EP as I, as I abbreviated here, what that's going to do is it is going to convert trypsinogen into trypsin. Okay, so yeah, that basically settles that. And recall that the stimulus for all this is time entering the duodenum. All right, do we have any questions so far? So, in yeah. case, um, um, it says number six, trypsin. Um, what would we write for that? So number six for trypsin, uh, let me look at the study guide here. So trypsin, it is an enzyme that is now, Are you to me? Oh, that is, sorry. That is now activated, thank you. And it's going to break down peptides into smaller peptide fragments. So keep in mind, we are not at the stage yet where we are going to break down the peptides into the individual amino acids. We're not there yet. Um, so question for you guys. Do you remember, and this is only if you're uh, like in your 30s like me or, or, or uh, older, but um, uh, there was a type of chip, well, not, a, not a type of chip, it was a type of, I guess you can call it chip technology and it was called um oh, oh, were called olesterol or olestra the chips were called wow chips does anyone um re remember that yeah i remember them yeah 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 uh, me too yeah i remember them too fondly and uh level we're going to meet all the once more, as I said, don't, don't take it personally. You could un unmute yourself if you if you need to. So, anyways, this was a type of fat. It was a type of fat that the fat molecule was too large to to be absorbed through the through the walls of the of the intestines because, as we talked about. Light paste is ultimately what's going to break it down into smaller, smaller fragments. Then it's going to be absorbed in the in, in intestines, and it's going to be absorbed into the um, the lymph, lymphatic system. So we're going to talk about um, uh, why that failed, which is shocking because this literally made your chips. If you recall, this made your chips zero have zero grams of fat so your chips the calorie content was cut in half but they tasted exactly like chips and it's like 
and and no wonder why it was called wow because these chips literally had zero calories and but yeah it was really popular and then it failed miserably all right so i'm gonna come up with your questions of the day just give me one second to post them so your first question of the day if you want to get started on it now is what is the stimulus for cck secretion easy one second one is why is bicarbonate necessary um, for digestion to proceed in the duodenum that's question two and question three is what is the role of trypsin and what activates it all right so let's give me one moment to post that all right so it's posted for one section and now it is going to be posted in the other section okay so everyone should be seeing um, the topic now and I will check back with you guys in three minutes Okay, everyone. So finish up your last thoughts so we can continue on our adventure. And I'm going to go back to my friends list here. And it is going to be Marley. So Marley, you are next on my top list. So Marley, can you tell us what the stimulus is for CCK secretion?
Harley? I'm honestly still working on that, but I'm getting to it right now. So All right. This one. Sorry. Okay. Jessica, you're next on the list. What is your take on this? I wrote time. Yes, correct. It is time. So recall that the digestive system, I'm not sure if I told you this, but one fourth of all neurons in the body are found in the enteric nervous system, which is the digestive nervous system. One fourth. So, so it detects chyme and it and it's going to release CCK. Outstanding. Okay, next on my list is Alec. Can you tell us why bicarbonate is necessary for digestion to proceed in the duodenum? Uh, bicarbonate is necessary because it raises the pH of chyme, uh, so digestive enzymes will work properly. Perfect. Um, enzymes, if you, re re if you remember your um, general bio class, is, is they require a very narrow range of pH in order to function correctly. And that pH is right around eight. All right, thank you very much, Alec. And now three, my next top top lister is going to be Josh. So Josh, um, what is the role of trypsin and what activates it? So um, trypsin breaks down peptides into smaller fragments. I think enteropeptidase activates it. Correct, enteropeptidase is going to activate um, uh, trypsin by converting it from trypsinogen to trypsin. Okay, and there is one thing that we need to talk about now. So thank you every, everyone for your participation. So we need to talk about exactly what activates what here as far as protein digestion. I'm going to go ahead and clear this. So it's important to note that trypsinogen is going to be activated in the trypsin. using the enzyme enteropeptidase. And we also know that chymotrypsin sorry, chymotrypsinogen is going to be converted into chymotrypsin with the assistance of trypsin. And this occurs in the lumen of the duodenum. So my question for you guys is, why is it that these are secreted from the pancreas in, in their inactive forms. Wouldn't it make more sense if the pancreas just secreted trypsin and chymotrypsin? Wouldn't that make more sense? Is there something else that they're used for in that um, the structure or before it's broken down or before it's... Mm, well, that is a very good, good question. That's a very good thought. Is this to like control the amount that's being broken down? So it's not constantly being? Um, Are there too many case, floating so. around? Not in this case, but that is a very reasonable thought. Totally under, I totally understand that that, that that does make sense. Well, the answer has to, to do with this, a condition called pancreatitis. And what happens with, with with pancreatitis is that there is a problem where the, the pancreatic duct gets blocked. And keep in mind that the pancreas 
is a protein-based organ. And what exactly does trypsin and chymotrypsin do? Jasmine, what exactly does, does trypsin and chymotrypsin do? They break down peptides into smaller. Exactly, peptides. exactly. So what's gonna happen is that if these, if these enzymes stick around in the pancreas for too long, what's gonna happen is that trypsin and chymotrypsin are going to activate. And as Jasmine said, they break down proteins. So what they are going to do is they are going to begin to break down the tissues of the pancreas because now they are activated. So trypsin and chymotrypsin are going to trigger a process called autodigestion. Autodigestion, which is the same exact thing that would happen if pepsinogen was converted into pepsin in the gastric pits. So, so pancreatitis, one cause of it is going to be caused by a blocked pancreatic duct. Trypsin and chymotrypsin are going to activate and they're going to start to digest the pancreas causing inflammation. So that's why they're stored in their inactive form in the pancreas because if they were active, then they would digest it. All right, radical. Any questions? Yeah, what causes that? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, it could be a couple things. It could be um, uh, a, a, gall, a gallbladder stone. Um, usually, unfortunately, the more common um, reason is a cancerous growth. And, and what, what that can do is um, the, the, uh, the tissue growth can actually block the secretion of the estrogen hormones. So those are the two normally. It's either a duct blockage or it could be, unfortunately, a, a cancer. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Very good. Uh, I have Very a question. Mm -hmm. So the only reason they're kept in their inactive forms is in case of a blockage? Um, well, rec recall that they're, um, uh, they're synthesized and stored in the pancreas on, until they're needed. So... so it's not just a blockage, it's just be, so they don't digest the pancreas too. Exactly, exactly. Okay. But if they stick around in the pancreas for too long, eventually they'll, they'll slowly convert over. And okay. that's, that's when auto digestion occurs. Okay, got it. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a fat lobule. Because recall that fats do, do not mix well with water. And what's going to happen is the same exact thing if you take some oil and you put it in a bottle of water and shake it, what you're, you're going to have is you're, you're going to have these big droplets of fat. And what we, we do know is that this fat molecule does not have much surface area because you have all this, all this volume here. So you have lots of volume, but you don't have much surface area. Recall the surface area is how much space there is on the structure itself. So what would happen is that light base would be terribly ineffective against this. Because it would, because it would, it would, would pretty much need to be from the outside in. It would be like trying to eat a cake um, Trying to eat a cake with one of those tiny ice cream straws, sorry, uh, ice cream spoons that you that you get the the wooden ones that don't that don't do anything. Right, right. Well, anyways, it would be much easier if you cut the cake into pieces first. That way, there's more surface area, more space for your fork to get at, instead of trying to just just uh, eat the entire cake using just a tiny fork. So enter bile, and bile is something called an emulsifier. Now milk, milk is an emulsification of fat because real milk, I'm talking the actual like real whole milk, has a lot of fat, but you don't actually see those, those globules. 
That's because it contains emulsifiers. Bile is an emulsifier. So what it's going to do is bile, this is bile, is going to react with this fat, this fat globule here. And this is the outcome that we are going to get. So what's gonna happen is that this fat globule is going to be broken down. It's going to be broken down into much smaller globules like this. And it's is going to be- Is the yellow lipase? Hmm? Is the yellow lipase? No, the, no, that's the red. Okay. So it's going to be surrounded by the bile. It's going to be emulsified by the bile. It's going to be broken down into super tiny droplets. And then what, what this does is you're going to drastically increase the surface area of the fat. And because of that, then you can have light base quickly break down these, these fat globules instead of trying to work on it from the outside in, like, like this. That would be terribly inefficient. This allows much more, much more light base enzymes to work simultaneously. Now, the problem is, is that if somebody has their, their, their gallbladder removed, what's gonna happen if they try and eat a meal that's high in fat is that these large fat globules there's there's not going to be enough bile present to 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 emulsify it so it's going to proceed down the digestive tract unabsorbed now you do know you or or you can can probably imagine that when you grease a pipe what happens to movement through the pipe it increases oh yeah exactly um yeah it's like anything else, if you coat something in fat, it's going to it's going to reduce friction and it's going to move pretty pretty fast. So so people that have um, gallbladder removal surgery, if they don't watch their fat intake, what's going to happen is they're going to develop distressing symptoms like diarrhea and things like that. So, anyways, that brings us back to our dis discussion of wow chips. So with the wild, wild chips is food scientists, they engineered a fat molecule that was too large to be absorbed through the intestines. So what happened is that it would, it would proceed harmlessly down, down your digestive tract and it would not be absorbed, meaning zero calories from fat. And it was really good. Um, I mean, great technology, absolutely groundbreaking because we actually could make a fat that could not be digested, meaning that foods would have the same exact flavor. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It was going to completely revol revolutionize um, uh, food science, except they didn't realize one thing. They didn't realize the power of the American appetite. So all of their research was based on a serving size that people would just have a small bag of chips. They didn't realize that fat-free to Americans basically means it's basically synonymous in, in most people's minds with calorie-free. So what happened is that people started eating bags of chips because why would they need to be guilty? An entire bag of chips could have just a fraction of the calories that the, the normal chips could have. And keep in mind that this fat could not be absorbed. And if you grease something too much, then it's going to move things faster. So what happened is that people soon discovered that by eating too many of these wild chips, they started to develop severe gastrointestinal distress. And even more distress, distressing is some of them found that they were leaking excrement into their garments, a term called anal leakage. And of course, we Americans, we did, we did do anything that we Americans are good at. We, uh, we started suing. 
And basically, um, their argument was that they should have made it more clear that eating too much wild chip, eating too much cholesterol would result in anal leakage. So I believe they started putting warnings on their bag saying warning um, may cause anal leakage. And when you put that on your product, your product's over. Like you're, you're, you're doomed. No one wants to, no one wants that to happen at work or at, or at any time. So unfortunately, um, we no longer have the benefit of wild chips because people decided that they couldn't handle their responsibility. All right, any questions on, on that? I really did want to mention it. Aren't those the chips that made you poop your pants? Exactly, yep. Yeah. May cause anal leakage. Yes. Yes, they were. <laughs> but see, that's the, uh, that's the thing, is the, is the media, the media's job was to chastise us for being gluttons. And instead, they made these poor chips whose only goal was to give us a low calorie chip experience, they, they demonize them. When instead, we are the enemy. But that's another topic for a different day. It's just, I just set up a blog with all of my opinions on things. I would read. Yay. One day, one day when I have time. Okay, great. So what's going to happen here is moving on to fat digestion and absorption. The first thing that's going to happen is bile is going to emulsify fat, and it's going to give it a white, milky appearance, which is why milk is white. It's because um, the fats are emulsified. If I remember correctly, I believe that non-fat milk might actually be colored white. I think, I think. Don't quote me on that, but I'm I know that fat-free milk is basically, it's basically a, kind of an oxymoron because milk is supposed to have a high amount of fat in it. Um, okay, so anyways, the lipase is going to break down the fats into monosaccharides, sorry, mono, monoglycerides, Free fatty acids, and cholesterol fragments. So if you want kind of a close-up of it, it's actually going to be given a name called a micelle or micelle. I'm not exactly sure what the, 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 the correct pronunciation is of it, but it's pretty much going to be coded in this sort of a sheath of bile. And in this sheath of bile, we're going to have some phospholipids over here. We're also going to have some mono, monoglycerides, which I'll draw here. We're going to have some free fatty acids, which I'll draw here. And we're going to have also some 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 cholesterol fragments and it's all going to be encased in this kind of a bubble of um this this bubble called a micelle and as i said it's going to be surrounded in bile it's called a micelle and if i'm going to draw a picture of exactly what happens with it is that this this micelle, which I'll draw here in, in green. So this is going to be um, diffusion steps. So this, this micelle here is actually going to diffuse through the cell, like so. And it's going to break apart into fragments. So it, is, so it is going to break apart into free fatty acids. It's going to break apart into, into cholesterol. It's going to break apart into mono, monoglycerides. I'll just, I'll just call them Mg. 
And then what they are, are going to do is they're actually going to recombine. They're going to they are, are going to recombine into a structure called a chylomicron, which I'll draw like this. So they are going to recombine in a structure called a chylomicron. And what it is, is it is going to be recombined um, of free fatty acids, monoglycerides, and cholesterol. And these are going to be recombined inside the cell. This is now, now an actual structure. And what's, what's, what's going to happen is that it is eventually going to diffuse through the cell. And it is going to go through a tract called the lymphatic system. So this here is the lymphatic. And really the, the lymphatic system kind of kind of runs side by side with the, the circulatory system. But the chylomicron is going to diffuse into the lymphatic system, not in not into the blood. It's actually the chylomicron is too big. To, uh, to, uh, to diffuse in, in, into the bloodstream, but it can get into the lymphatic system just fine. So it's going to enter the lymphatic system, and then it's going to diffuse on its miry its miry way. So let's let's go ahead and recap this. So bile is going to act on the globule of fat. And it's going to break down the globule of fat into smaller fragments. What it's going to do is, I'll, you know, why don't I go ahead and add, add here? It's going to do something called emulsify. So it is going to emulsify the large fat, fat molecule. So, so now we're going to have smaller uh, fat droplets encased in bile. By the way, do you guys know what kind of cell? is recycled to make bile. Anyone know? Red blood cells? Red blood cells, exactly. Excellent. Yeah, not a lot of people uh, know that factoid, but it's, but it's kind of interesting to think. Our body can recycle everything, can it? So anyways, these tiny globules of fat, since we've drastically increased the, the surface area of the, of the fat molecule, is now lipase can go ahead and catabolize it. And it's going to catabolize it into simpler fats, monoglycerides, free fatty acids, and cholesterol. And it's going to be in kind of a loose structure called a micelle. And then once we get in, into the cell, the micelle is going to basically disintegrate. The free fatty acids and, and the monoglycerides and cholesterol are going to separately diffuse into the cell. And they're going to be recombined inside the cell into something called a chylomicron. And the chylomicron is going to diffuse out of the cell into the lymphatic system, where it's, where it's going to be deposited into the bloodstream later. Now, as we see here, the lymphatic system and the bloodstream, they kind of go side by side. The chylomicron is too big to fit into the bloodstream, thankfully. So instead, it is transported through the lymphatic system and is taken to the liver. I have a question. Sure. Um, so do you mind just clarifying? So after the, um, the bile emulsifies the, is that kind? Um, so the, sorry, the fat. Uh, sorry, the yeah. fat. So once that happens and it gets broken down into smaller fragments, mm -hmm. what you have drawn on the right is what's going inside the Michael. So this here is basically this. Okay. So what's going to happen is, is that once, oh, once okay. lipase di digests the fat globule, it is going to basically Di di digest what's inside this um, this fat globule, 
It's going to break it down into monoglycerides, free fatty acids, and cholesterol. Okay, makes sense. And this is going to be a micelle. In fact, it might be helpful if I just call this a micelle. And when you say into the cell, what cell are you talking about? Yeah, that was my next question. It is going to be the enterocytes. Oh, okay. And then out into the liver. Okay. Yeah. Is this part of the duodenum? Uh, actually, part of it, but this is actually going to go on throughout the entire small intestines. Okay. Yeah, so okay. The, yeah, the, the entire small intestines is where most of this absorption is going to happen. Okay, so, so on the right, it's basically a zoomed in version of the Michael, the green with the little broken fatty acids that now enter inside the enterocyte cell? Yeah, so I'll add this in. So on the left is going to be the zoomed in inversion, but this is, is showing the steps of, of, of diffusion, is once you have this micelle, and it's going to passively diffuse because it's lipid based. Okay, so, so it's going to diffuse the particles inside the cell into that cell? Exactly, yeah. So the, so the, the, the micelle, when it gets to the cell, is going to basically break apart, but the free fatty acids and the monoglycerides can passively diffuse in. Same with, with cholesterol, since they're all lipid based. And then that's when inside the cell they're going to reform into the chylomicron. Oh, they're going to reform into the chylomicron? Yeah, exactly. So these three are going to become the chylomicron. And I don't know if you said it, but do you mind saying again what exactly is the chylomicron? It's more or less a, a solid structure that is comprised of proteins, cholesterol, um, monoglycerides, and free fatty acids. In fact, let me add in the proteins too. Are we going to get into what happens when it gets into the liver? Uh, yes, we are when we get to the um, chapter 22, which is metabolism. Okay. Yeah, when it gets in, into the liver, long story short, is it's going to, um, the cholesterol at least, is going to be carried on two transporters, low-density lipoprotein and high-density lipoprotein, which I'm sure that you, you've heard of those. So uh, we're going to quickly talk about the anatomy and physiology of uh, the actual structure of the small intestines. Can I ask a quick question about cholesterol real fast? Of course. Uh, is the cholesterol in the micelle? Yep. So it comes into the cell by itself and through the micelle? Yeah, so the micelle doesn't actually diffuse in itself. Um, it's simpler to teach it that way, but actually each, each component diffuses into the cell separately. Okay. So anyways, this is to, to show you the concept of surface area. And the digestive tract is a perfect example of, of why surface area is so important. Um, now, we have a remarkably effective digestive uh, tract. And despite that, we still cannot absorb every nutrient that goes through our body. There's always going to be some, some, uh, some form of nutrients that are going to be excreted out. Uh, not to get this, this disgusting, but dogs are very efficient as far as ensuring that they get every nutrient possible, and they will actually redigest their excrement if they see it around, because why would they want those nutrients to go to waste? Um, uh, we, we humans do not nearly agree with that. But the only reason why we have such an, such an efficient digestive system is because of surface area. So if we look here, this is just a straight tube. If our digestive tract looked like this, we would not be very successful as a species at all because we would not be able to absorb nearly as much of the, the nutrients. However, this is what our, what our digestive tract actually looks like. So if you look here, look what's going to be added in. We are going to have these finger-like structures. 
And if you look here, look at how much more surface area this adds. So, so this is, has high surface area. And this has low surface area. And to make it more impressive, if I'm going to blow up, up one of these, so here we have the structure here called a, a villi or, or, or villus. So look at how Im impressive all the surface area is. Not only do you, do you have these pro protrusions, but you also have these crypts here. So anyways, one of these protrusions is called a villus. And each of, of, these, of these, these structures here, each villus is going to further have tiny structures called microvilli. So it has tiny hairs. So these in turn are going to be called, circle one, microvilli. which is an incredible use of surface area. Not only do we have these protrusions, which increases surface area, but we further increase surface area by having finger-like structures on the finger-like structures, these microvilli. So it is a, a, uh, in, a, a, an amazing display of evolution that we have evolved this, this immensely um, efficient structure that can, uh, that can maximize surface area. So we have a tube that's basically about, I don't know, three to five feet long, yet with surface area, it dramatically increases how much can be uh, absorbed. So I think that's basically all that we can squeeze in. Um, I do wanna know also that this makes a lot of use of what we call the lymphatic system which the lymphatic system kind of runs underneath the each villus like this. And of course, we know that that's where fats are going to be absorbed through. And we also have the, the bloodstream as well. What was the blue? Blue is the lymphatic system. I'll, I'll clarify that in just one moment. So the blue here is going to be the lymphatic system. And the red here is going to be the blood. And basically your fats are going to be absorbed through your lymphatic system and through your blood is going to be a, a absorbed your proteins and your vitamins and your carbohydrates. Uh, one last thing, there are enzymes here found on the surface of the villi, and they're called brush border enzymes. And they're called brush border enzymes because they're actually located on the border of these, these uh, uh, villi. And what these, these do is that they are going to do conversions into monomers. What, professor, what did you say the blood absorbs? Proteins, nutrients, and sugars. Carbs, thank you. So an example of a breast border enzyme, for example, is lactase. Because lactase converts a disaccharide into glucose and galactose. So, so breast border enzymes, they're actually going to convert things into their monomer form into amino acids, into sugars. So these brush border enzymes are found all throughout the, um, the cells of the small intestines. All right, class, that is basically a wrap. As I said, you are going to have a test, test quiz on chapter 21, next, next class. It will be very similar, show up to class on time, and you'll be having your Zoom camera on, and the quiz will be on Canvas. 
So we do have some chat activity here and I'll also take some questions now. Professor, so the quiz won't be on Proctoro? Nope. Um, Procterio is only for exams. Okay. Thank you for asking. Um, Shia LaBeouf is an actor. News to me. I, Shia LaBeouf. Oh, got it. Yeah, I'm, I have not been outside apparently ever. Uh, I'll have to Google him. Um, which are hormones and which are enzymes? Um, hopefully I, I clarified that. If not, then you can ask me during lab. Um, what does pink say? What does green say? Pink says villus, V-I-L-L-U-S. That's singular for villi. That's those finger-like protrusions. Oh, Michael already answered it. Yes, and green is microvilli. Thank you, Michael. Okay, any other other questions? Yeah, is starch digestion going to be on the quiz? Hmm? It's the last page of this um, outline. Chapter twenty-one. Yeah. So this so this lecture and uh, Tuesday's lecture. Professor, I have a question. Sure, Marley. When is our lab exam exactly? Next week, and thank you for reminding me. I gotta make the study guide on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. you got okay. it. You so, be, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you can go ahead. All right. I just wanna know when you're gonna be posting the, the quiz, the study guide. Uh, quiz study guide, I will get on it as soon as I'm done with lab. Okay, my next question is, so the following week, so next week we have our lab exam for physio, or yeah, our lab exam. The week after that, our group presentations are due, and then when is our lecture exam? Lecture exam five, it should be on the syllabus, um, but I'll double check. I'm pretty sure it's like right before, um, right before the final, I think, but I got to double uh, check it. It says May 5th. Oh, well. There we are. Okay. Cool. Um, Fifth is a Sunday. Really? Oh, I'll fix it. Then it's probably May 7th if I put down May, May 5th. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and double check it. All right, thank you. The fifth is a Tuesday, by the way. Okay, good, good. Um, so if we have lab on Tuesday, but we decide to take the Thursday lab, can we do our test on Thursday? Um, or do you want everybody where they're supposed to be for the exam? Yeah, that will be, be easiest for me, just if everyone's where they're supposed to be, just because, yeah, it's it's a pain to, to coordinate it. So for, the, okay. uh, so for the quizzes or the lab exam, let's go ahead and stick with our, um, our, our pre-planned groups. Okay. Okay, anything else? Uh, professor, one quick question. Uh, work cited for our presentations. Do you want it in a specific format or just um, any uh, type of format? I'm actually not requiring a, a, uh, a, a, a work cited section, but if there is a study that you find that's, that's interesting and you want to tell us, then, then much appreciated if you were to make include that my my rationale behind that is i pretty much know it if you're if you're if someone's making something up so i do reserve the uh um i do reserve the right to ask for sources but thankfully in all my years teaching physio i've never had to ask for sources so let's keep the trend going i think you Uh, professor, is it official that we we are doing the recorded um, presentations? Yes. So I, it seems like many of you were not fans of just sitting in behind the computer and just hearing each other talk for two hours, which I don't I don't blame you. I'm honestly sitting here and and teaching you all sitting down and not being able to get up and walk around. It's 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 rough. Um, yeah. So. So I don't, I don't blame you. Most of you want to watch the pre-recorded lectures, and I think most of you are probably happier doing that anyways. So that's what we're going to do. Um, 
give me a couple of days to iron out the, the details, but but yeah, that's that's going to be the plan. Wait, if we record it and you said we have to like we have to answer questions.